Hi there, everybody, and uh, welcome to Grace City Church. Great to have you uh, with us today. And um, today is our last um, time of putting out the uh, sermon on YouTube and uh, on Zooms, uh, because next week we're going to be gathering in person, which uh, is going to be great to be able to do that again. And while there's still uh, restrictions, um, that's okay. We can still gather together and, uh, and do that. So the evening is going to be doing different things. The morning uh, congregation is going to be back in the building at uh, 10 a.m. So it'd be great uh, to see you there. And everyone is welcome, uh, no matter whether you're vaccinated or not. Uh, that, that doesn't matter. So it'd be great to see you there. So today uh, also is the end of our What We Believe series, and I hope you have found the series really helpful. Uh, I hope you've grown through it as you've learned more, but not just learned head knowledge, but hopefully grown uh, in, the, in your spirit uh, and matured as uh, we've looked at different topics. Uh, so today is the last one, and um, I'm looking at this topic of what does it mean to uphold Christian standards uh, today. Uh, so we're going to get into that. Let me just pray. Lord, I pray you'd be uh, with us as uh, we explore this. Um, I pray that even uh, as we hear things we've probably heard before, but I pray you would uh, touch our hearts afresh and call us afresh to holiness, call us afresh to live uh, in the best way, uh, which is living in the way that you have set out for us. So won't you stir our hearts again today, call us afresh to holiness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So I wonder if, um, if you feel like a dinosaur at times. Do you feel like a dinosaur? Increasingly, you told that um, the uh, standards we have, the morals we have, are old-fashioned and outdated. And uh, we can, you know, take offense to that. We can look at that and we, we point to the Bible and then we, th we think, well, actually the Bible's over 2,000 years old and older, uh, you know, some of it. Uh, and so maybe they are right. Uh, so we can be really challenged uh, as we consider how we live in this day and age. And thankfully, though, although the Bible is an old book, uh, God is as futuristic as you can get. Uh, God is in the future already. And so you can't actually get more futuristic than God. He is more up to date uh, than anyone else. And so actually the way that he is laid out for us to live uh, transcends all uh, ages and times because he uh, knows uh, what is best. He created us. He designed us. And he knows what is the best way for us to live. And so what is laid out in the Bible, uh, God's word, uh, that is actually relevant today. And the way that he leads us, the way he calls us uh, to holiness is the best way for us to live. Now, obviously, uh, today, the question says, what does it mean to uphold Christian standards today? And... Um, in one sense, obviously, through every age, Christians uh, have had to uh, find uh, and fight, really, to, to stand uh, on their beliefs. Over the centuries, the church has been persecuted, and we stand, really, on a long, long list of martyrs who have stood firm in what they believe and not retaliated in a similar manner to their oppressors. But having said that, it's a challenge for us today uh, as our culture shifts and our culture shifts away from some Christian values to uh, all sorts of other values. I'm talking about us here in Australia at, at this time. We find things uh, like tolerance as a virtue that's being embraced, but the way we see that applied is that it's tolerance seemingly for everything else except Christianity. We don't seem to find much tolerance for Christianity. And so we find a real challenge in how uh, we have to live in our current society and in our culture. It's a real challenge for us, increasingly getting more and more difficult with a rising antagonism to Christian beliefs and values. 
Now, in my reading of Scripture, uh, what I see is that these end times, which we're in, we're in end times, as these end times get closer and closer to their conclusion, which they will, uh, the Father will come and will wrap up uh, this world and bring a new heaven and a new earth and uh, there will be uh, a, an end to what we currently know when as we we get closer and closer to that actually we will experience both the growth of the church and the growth of persecution both these things will increase and you can uh, look at something like um, Jesus parable uh, of the weeds uh, in Matthew 13 uh, to see this picture in in that parable Jesus speaks about the weeds being sown by the enemy amongst the wheat which is the kingdom of heaven and both of them grow up together uh, and it's only at the harvest time when the weeds are dealt with. It's a picture, I think, of what we see, and as we'll see as we go towards end times, an increase of weeds, an increase of the kingdom. Uh, both these things increasing until the final day when judgment will come and uh, the weeds will be dealt with. Well, I guess you're saying thanks for the encouraging news. Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I think that's uh, the way that it's going to happen. We're going to face increasing persecution. We're going to find it more and more difficult uh, to live out our values uh, in, in the world. But the encouraging part is that God's kingdom also continues to grow. While persecution may increase, we can also expect the power of God to be released on and through His church and for more and more people to be saved and added to the church. So we can know God's power uh, to enable us to live uh, in the way that we are called to at the same time. But really, the church, and when I say church, uh, remember I mean actually you and me, we are the church. I don't mean some organization, but the church uh, has two options. Either we stand firm on our beliefs and values, uh, and face uh, what will often be derision uh, of be being called outdated, of being called intolerant or bigoted, or we soften our standards and compromise our values so we look more and more like the world until uh, there would probably be very little to distinguish us. Now, Quentin, a few weeks ago, uh, taught on the kingdom really helpfully for us, and he taught us that um, we are a part of a different kingdom to the kingdom of this world. We are part of God's kingdom. And so that does mean that we are to live by different standards to the world. This kingdom of God's has its own standards and values. And therefore we are to look different to the kingdom of this world. In all of this, I want to say right up front that one of the things we should never be able to be accused of is that we are unloving. Please, church, let's never be accused of the fact that we are unloving. While we may disagree with worldly standards, let's make sure that we never ever compromise on loving our neighbor as ourselves, even as we express our difference and, and maybe disagreement with what's being said, God's kingdom is love. In fact, God is love. And we must find a way to stand clear and firm on God's standards while loving those that vehemently disagree, uh, even unto giving our lives. We've got, we are called to love our neighbor, to love those around us, to love those that persecute us, love those that disagree with us, love those that uh, call us all sorts of names. Now we as Christians, as the church, are neither to withdraw from the world. Uh, we read in John 17, uh, 15, where Jesus is praying and he says, My prayer is not that you, the Father, take them, that's us, out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. So Jesus prays, not that we be taken out, of the world. So we're not to withdraw uh, to a monastery, to communes, hide uh, in our own little bubble. We are called 
to live in the world, but we are not to live in worldliness. What do I mean by worldliness? Well, worldliness is when we absorb, if you like, and internalize the desires and ways of living that the world that unbelievers display. We, we to live in this world, but we're not to absorb the kingdom values of this world. We're not to internalize them. We're not to own them in that way. J.I. Packer, uh, he says this. He says, God's first requirement of Christians in this world is that they be different from those around them. Observing God's moral absolutes. Well, making a statement like that, we already start to run into trouble with the world because the world doesn't really believe in moral absolutes. So he says, so we must be different from those around them, observing God's moral absolutes, practicing love, avoiding shameful license, and not losing our dignity as God's image bearers through any form of irresponsible self-indulgence. I love the way he puts that, that we are not to lose our dignity as God's image bearers. What a privilege it is that we are called to be God's image bearers. There's a dignity in that. Not an arrogance, please, not an arrogance because we call to love, but a dignity, a dignity in being God's image bearers. And we are not to lose that. Now, I love what Packer says, but let's also look at what the Bible says. And there's some great chunks of scripture that help us in the New Testament. Colossians 3, 1 to 14 is great. Um, Romans 12. But I want to pick up uh, and read to Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. It says this. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Don't live in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. See, we must understand that, that the world is separated from the life of God. And so we can't expect or uh, use the world to come up with good morals, with good standards, because they are separated from the life of God. We can't follow uh, what the world lays out as a good way to live. Paul says, having lost all sensitivity, they, that's the world, have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And church, we have to again and again consider this putting off and taking on. The Colossians verses talk about being clothed, that we put off our old self, that corrupted self that lived in the way the world lives, not understanding true life, God's standards, not understanding the best way to live. And we put on, we, we take on this new attitude in our minds, this new self where we are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's who we are. That's the reality of who we are. And we have to live in accordance with that. So these verses, they um, call for a clean break from the world's value systems and lifestyles. There's a break from them. There's a taking off and a putting on, a break from the world's value systems and lifestyles. I'd like us to note that uh, actually the world, um, having been created uh, in God's likeness, there is something in the world that I believe makes everyone actually appreciate some of what God says is good. They, 
appreciate nature, creation, appreciate um, some good things. But we cannot expect the world to live in a way that pleases God. And our purpose is not to try and impose God's kingdom values and lifestyle on unbelievers. If that's our aim, then this may sound harsh, but in reality we are just trying to dress up a corpse. Because the Bible says that we are dead in our transgressions before we become alive in Christ. And if we're just trying to put on uh, Christian values and morals on the world, then we, we're just trying to make the outside look good when actually it's dead on the inside, unregenerated by Jesus Christ. So that can't be our purpose. Our purpose, rather, is that we are to aim to see unbelievers come to faith in Christ. And as they come to faith in Christ, they are born again, made holy, as we've just been reading, made to be like God, holy and righteous. And then the values will change. And so the way we can see the northern beaches change, the way we can see Sydney, Australia change in morals, change in the way uh, our country lives, is by seeing people saved. And as they are saved, come to life in Jesus Christ, they start to live in the way God intended. Suddenly, laws change. Suddenly, there's a, a difference in the way the economy runs because people are handling their finances differently. And so we have to keep our aim on seeing uh, the world come to Christ. Now, I think our biggest challenge in our Western culture is the, uh, the whole boiling frog scenario. Uh, it's not actually, I believe, scientifically true that, uh, that if you put a frog in water, you could slowly heat it up till it boils um, because it's not going to stay in there. But you get the idea, you know the analogy that if you try and put something into boiling hot water, it's going to jump straight out. But if you uh, slowly increase it, there's, you know, it's going to stay for longer. Very slow changes can be imperceptible. They, they're not noticed. That's what that is trying to tell us. And I think that's the danger for us, is the slow slip of godly standards. The slow slip. And I'm not talking about the world, because we know that that's expected. But for us, as Christians in our lives, we have to watch the slow slip of godly standards and not living in the way God intended. Because we are constantly bombarded by the world's attitudes, by what the world holds as important, um, by the way the world thinks we should live. And it's challenging and difficult for us to continue to press forward in godly standards. I want to just take one example, if we take sex before marriage, uh, or sex out of marriage, if you like, as an example. Now, the Bible is very clear that sex is a wonderful thing that is to take place within the covenant of marriage. You can read Hebrews 13. It tells us that. And there's so many positives in the Bible about uh, sex being a good thing in marriage, in a covenant. But in my albeit limited experience of about 25 years of discipling young Christian men, I find it sadly harder and harder to find someone these days who has not had sex before marriage. Why is that the case? Well, our society, we can see it in movies, in ads, in uh, just looking around, it totally accepts that sex outside of marriage is a normal thing to do. Uh, we can sleep around, one night stands, affairs, it's become the norm. And so it's become more and more accepted in the church as just one of those things. Just one of those things. And if we're not careful, we can start to think uh, thoughts like, can we really expect young men and women to remain pure for marriage? Can we really expect that? Does does it really matter if they remain pure for marriage? Isn't sexual compatibility important to know about before marriage? 
And by the way, do we really need to get married anyway? Can't we just live together? We start to entertain those questions. We start to uh, think that maybe it's not a big deal. And we want to love our young people. We want them to stay in the church. We correctly don't want to bring condemnation on them. We want them to know the grace of God, that if we sin, if we make a mistake, uh, that we can know God's grace and continue in freedom. We don't have to live in condemnation. That is the devil's trick to condemn us and say, you're not acceptable to God. We know that we are acceptable to God. He's forgiven our sins. So it's not about that, but we can just let sin slide. We must have a proper perspective of God's holiness and that his hatred for sin was so great that he sent his son to die on a cross to deal with it in our lives. And so we receive grace. And grace, as we know in Titus 2, tells us that the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It's the grace of God. So sin, while having been paid for, forgiven by God, by the Christian, it still, though, has consequences in this life for us. Having sex with someone out of marriage has emotional consequences, it has spiritual consequences, and it could well have physical consequences. Babies that can be conceived as, as a result. There can be all sorts of consequences. And our, but our lives as Christians are to be an example of and a witness to the true life found in God. So we have to, we have to, by the grace of God, live holy lives. And we have to hold these standards. We have to say, God, what you have said, the way for us to live is the best way. You have said that actually sex is a wonderful thing within the covenant of marriage. It's the best way for us to live. We need to hold to that, that it is the best way to live. We need to encourage our young people. This is, this is the way to live. This is the best thing for you. Do you want to enjoy sex the most? Do you want to get the most out of life? Well, live the way God wants you to. Hold the standard that God says. It's not to try and deprive you, but it's actually to bring life. God's values are not there to restrict us, but to bring us into real life, freedom, and peace. And to be the light in the darkness that we are called to be, we have to look like him who is the light of the world, Jesus Christ. As we've read, grace enables us to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can know the power of the Holy Spirit daily to help us live in the way God intended. J.R. Packer, again, he is helpful. He uses this phrase, um, that we are to have a motivational detachment from this world. A motivational detachment. In other words, while being in this world, we're not motivated by the desires of the world. Our motivation now comes from God and His grace to us. As I was preparing this, uh, I was reminded of um, Keith Green, a Christian singer in the 70s. Many of you may I have never heard his music, but some of you would have. Uh, and Keith Green uh, became a Christian when he was 21, uh, and then sadly died in a plane crash at age 28 uh, with his three-year-old son and two-year-old daughter, left behind his wife, who was six weeks pregnant, and his one-year-old. You can read uh, his story. I'd encourage you to read it. It's in a book called No Compromise, called No Compromise. And like the title suggests, Keith's life in those seven short years, he pressed into God's holiness in the most amazing way. And he really shook the music world uh, with his integrity. Uh, he used to give free concerts. 
Uh, he used to give away uh, his music albums, really shook uh, the music world because of the way he was living. And it's truly challenging when you read his story, the way he gave himself for others, gave himself for the good of others. One of the things I love in his story is how his understanding of grace grew, where at first he was uh, driven to live a holy life by fear. It changed as he, this is after he'd been a Christian, as he be understood the grace of God. Let me read you just an extract. It says, after striving for years to measure up to God's holiness, at times even questioning his own salvation. You know, we can do that if we think that, that we have to, in our own strength, live up to God's standards. Well, then we start to question even our own salvation. After doing that, Keith came into a deeper understanding of the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross, both to forgive his sins and to clothe him in his righteousness. It was like a huge weight had been lifted off his chest. It wasn't that Keith became less concerned with purity and holiness, but now he was more motivated by love and less by fear in his pursuit of Jesus. He learned so much more about God's grace and the importance of pausing simply to behold his glory and enjoy his presence. He lived an amazing short life as a Christian, seven years, but... He lived as such an example of not compromising and pouring himself out. I find that challenging. What are we doing with our maybe many more than seven years? How are we living? And he understood that, came to understand that our motivation for holiness is God's love. And if you are still striving as a Christian under legalism, then God wants to set you free today. He wants to break that bondage of legalism, that you, you cannot live up to God's standards. That's why he saved you by grace in the first place. But having saved you by grace, he says to the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, who has cut in on you? And now you're trying to live in this other way, you're trying to live not by God's grace. We need to live by God's grace. It is the only way we will be able to uphold Christian standards today. And so I pray that if you are living with legalism, if you are living thinking, I'm just not good enough. What I've done today is not good enough. I, I didn't do well this week. It was not good enough, not good enough. And so I have to turn away from God because God's turned away from me. Accept God's love afresh today. Know his grace poured out that will bring you to live in the way that he longs for. Now as the church uh, and again, therefore, as every Christian, we've got three main tasks in this world. First one is evangelism. We're to seek the salvation of unbelievers by all means at our disposal. The second one is neighbor love. We're to love our neighbors as ourselves. And that should lead us into deeds of mercy and kindness of all sorts, seeking the good of others. Because of this neighbor love, we'll be people who fight against injustice. And we'll stand up against situations where people are being hurt and badly treated. We'll stand up against abortion or other unjust killing of people. So our neighbor love will cause us also not just to want to live by Christian standards, but to stand up for injustice in the world. The third main task of the world is to full, fulfill what is called God's cultural mandate. We see in Genesis 1, 28 to 30, God gives mankind a mandate to manage God's world, to manage this world that is God's. And this stewardship is part of our calling in Christ. And that means that we will look also to do what's best for the environment, to do what's best for animals, what's good uh, for the environment, the world around us. It's another part of our living. We are to involve ourselves in all forms of lawful human activity. And I'll say that again. We are to involve ourselves in all forms of lawful human activity. 
We are to live out our Christian values and standards so that we will be salt and light to people wherever possible. And when we're involved in all forms of lawful human activity, then we bring that light to every place, wherever people are working and things they're involved in, we call to bring our light to that. And God is our example of this in that he is not removed his providential kindness and mercy from the world. There's still what we call common grace. God still um, causes the seasons to happen. He still causes rain to come and sunshine to come. He, he still pours out his providential kindness and mercy on the world. We to follow his example. We see Jesus lived out God's way in every part of the culture of his day. He was accused of hanging out with the worst of sinners. But he was never influenced by them. He influenced them and brought them to real life in him. And that's how we are to live. Our lifestyle will be different to the unbelievers around us. Every stage of our life will look different. How we raise our children will be different. The boundaries we put in place for them will be different for, from their unbelieving friends. We will strive to bring them into purity and holiness of a God-filled family. It will mean we'll work hard as parents to not just say no to our kids, but to really disciple them. Our family will look different from the unbelieving family next door. How we live as young adults in our late teens and 20s will again look very different. How we engage with the opposite sex, our approach to alcohol and drugs and pornography will all be very different. In more mature adult adulthood, we will have different priorities for our finances, for our possessions. Our marriages will be submitted to God and our careers will not be our identity. And eventually in retirement at older age, we'll continue to work for God, being fathers and mothers to many and realizing that our real rest isn't now, but comes next as we transition to eternal life. So every stage of our lives is going to look different. And as I come to a close, I think we need to uh, kind of reconcile ourselves to some things and Maybe not only reconcile ourselves, but also we need to be convinced of some things. I want to just give you four things we need to, like today, let's get reconciled with them and let's be convinced of them. Firstly, let's reconcile ourselves to the fact that not only may we look different to those around us, but actually we will look and live differently to those around us because we are the light we will be shining light into the world secondly let's reconcile ourselves to the fact that it will be difficult at times even hard work we may be misunderstood we may be unpopular and we will often feel like a fish out of water to live as god intends us will mean that we will not always be accepted by our neighbors and our work colleagues. We need to reconcile ourselves with that fact. Thirdly, we need to be convinced that at the same time as being hard, God will empower us by his Holy Spirit to be his witnesses in how we live. And so we need to draw close to him daily for fresh courage and strength to stand. We need to be convinced of this, convinced that through the gospel, we will be a transforming cultural voice. Fourthly, we need to be convinced that the joy and freedom of living as God intended far outweighs any temporary sinful pleasure let's be convinced of that people that the joy and freedom of living as god intended far outweighs anything that the world has to offer i'll finish just repeating something i said at the start which was that in all of this one thing we should never be able to be accused of is being unloving <laughs> 
we don't want to be unloving in the way that we live. As much as we are different, as much as we hold different values, one of those values is to love our neighbor. And like Jesus, who was holy and pure, and yet gave himself for those dead in sin. He gave himself for those that hated and despised him. We too must seek to do all that we can to see the lost saved. We are set apart. We are God's holy ones, yet fully in this world, ready to give our lives to see others saved. So while we must stand firm with no compromise on our standards of holy living, we will pour out love, care and kindness in every way possible to all, including those who really disagree with us. Let me pray. Lord, we come to you as grateful ones. Lord, grateful that you have saved us by grace. Grateful, Lord, that... You have taken the weight off us of trying in our own strength to live up to some standards. But Lord, you have saved us by your grace and then you've empowered us by your spirit to live in the way that you have laid out, which we know is the best way possible. And so we give ourselves afresh, Lord, to living by the power of of your spirit in your grace, Lord, that we would stand firm, Lord. We would not compromise, Lord, with the world's standards, but we will take those standards off and we will put on the godly standards that daily, Lord, as we come to you for strength and courage, we will clothe ourselves, Lord, in your holiness and righteousness. We will clothe ourselves in your strength, in our new self that has been uh, born again, this new person, Lord. And a daily, Lord, we want to live in that way, Lord. And we want to see many saved, Lord. We want the way we live to be a bright, shining star to the world, Lord, that declares that your way is the only way, Lord, and that you are our creator, our king, our master. Lord, so I pray, won't you help us, help us today, help us on Monday, on Tuesday, as we're in workplaces, in schools, in universities, Lord, as we live in the world, wanting to be in every part of our culture and society, in sport and arts and education. Lord, we want to be in all these things, but we want to be there as your shining light to be a witness to you. So won't you help us, encourage us, stir us afresh today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church. Have a great week.